Hi comrades and welcome to another episode of Marxist Voice, podcast of the Revolutionary Communist Party. This episode will be listening to another talk from 2023's Revolution Festival, this time on the German Revolution. The German Revolution is one of the greatest tragedies in the world communist movement. It came one year after the Russian Revolution, and just like it, it swept away the Kaiser in a number of days. All over the country, Soviets were set up, and the working class had power in their hands. But unlike the Russian Revolution, where there was a Bolshevik party which had been prepared 14 years in advance, the revolutionary proletarian party, the Spartacus League, was founded one month after the revolution began. Andy will explain the events of the German Revolution and draw out most of all the need for a tempered revolutionary party prepared long in advance. Without further ado, this episode of Marxist Voice. Andy will explain the events of the revolution and draw out most of all the need for a tempered revolutionary leadership prepared long in advance. Without further ado, this episode of Marxist Voice. I think from the perspective of, of Marxism uh, and the struggle for communism, the German Revolution is in many ways uh, a key event in world revolutionary history. At the time, Lenin and the Bolsheviks had taken power in Russia following the October Revolution of 1917. And they'd done so with the perspective that the mighty example of the first worker state in history would act as inspiration for the workers of the world to follow suit. They understood that communism couldn't be built in Russia alone, and they depended on the spread of the revolution to more industrially advanced countries to materially support its development in Russia. And the German Revolution of November 1918, that we're here to discuss today, in which the German workers and soldiers overthrew the shackles of the Kaiser's despotism and single-handedly put an end to the slaughter and horror of the First World War is a striking example of the absolute correctness of Lenin's perspectives. The period of revolutionary upheaval in Germany would last from 1918 up until the defeat of the revolution in 1923. And during that time, the workers of Germany would make several attempts to take power into their hands. And the small handful of German revolutionaries that existed at the outbreak of the First World War would grow into a powerful communist party the largest communist party in the world, outside of Soviet Union, of course, with hundreds of thousands of members that commanded the support of millions of workers. Yet the German workers' militancy and their willingness to fight capitalism was never, um, their willingness to fight, despite that, capitalism was never overthrown uh, in Germany. Instead, the revolution was defeated. And it was this defeat that enabled the rise of Hitler and the Nazis Instead of working together with their brothers in Russia, the German workers um, found themselves humiliated and crushed under the jackboots of fascism. Fundamentally, the failure of the German revolution is a question of leadership, of the total absence of leadership in the stormy period of 1918 to 1919, and the incorrect policies of a leadership who botched the very real possibility of overthrowing capitalism in 1923. Perhaps more than any other revolution, the German experience is a tale of utmost tragedy. Had the revolution succeeded, the isolation of Russia would have been broken, and the revolutionary wave could have continued throughout Western Europe. Capitalism could have been destroyed, and all of its attendant horrors, most brutally concentrated in the Second World War, could have been stopped for once and for all. For reasons of time, I think uh, today, we'll see how we get to, uh, I'm going to try and focus on the events that last from November 1918 uh, up until the defeat of that phase of the revolution in, in January 1919. Uh, but the period after is equally rich in lessons for, for communists, and I hope that comrades will come into the discussion uh, to develop them further. Um, but where does this tale start? Well, we have to start, I think, firstly with an explanation and an understanding of uh, the German Social Democratic Party, the SPD. Uh, because without understanding that party and the role that it was to play in the betrayal of the revolution, we can't understand how these events uh, unfolded. Alan talked yesterday about the role of, of, of left reformism and how betrayal is inherent uh, in, in left reformism. Uh, he said it's not a question of, of, of intent, it's a question of the willingness uh, to fight capitalism, 
or otherwise you're bound by the laws of capitalism. Well, in the case of the German SPD, it wasn't just a question of uh, incorrect policies or actions. It was a question of actively seeking to liquidate uh, the revolution, to fight against the revolutionaries, to lead the counter-revolution in defense of capitalism uh, in Germany. And it's that conscious counter-revolutionary role uh, that distinguishes the experience of, 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 of Germany. The SPD was the largest and most powerful party in the Second International, the international that was founded uh, on the basis of Marxism, on the basis of, of revolutionary ideas. And in 1912, they had a million members. They had more than 15,000 full-time uh, party workers, and they had 90 daily papers across Germany. You know, the absolute scale of this party is, 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 is difficult to imagine. Lenin himself respected the SPD immensely, and he looked to it as the leaders of the international socialist movement. And the contribution of its leaders, uh, such as Kautsky, uh, who was known in the international movement as the Pope uh, of Marxism. But behind this revolutionary veneer, there was a deep rot at the heart of the SPD. It had grown during unprecedented decades of growth and capitalism. And as Marxists, we know that conditions determine consciousness. And the conditions of sustained economic growth in which the class, capitalist class could afford concessions uh, to the workers led the SPD to conclude that the struggle for socialism could be won through incremental reform of the capitalist system itself. This tendency grew imperceptibly and slowly uh, over the many years leading up to the First World War. And as such, the party was one that was only revolutionary uh, in words. In deeds and in practice, it was reformist through and through. The depth and scale of this degeneration was not even visible uh, to comrades such as Lenin. But the genuine revolutionaries in Germany, such as Rosa Luxemburg, were all too familiar with it and waged an implacable struggle against revisionism in the party. The gulf between the words and actions of the SPD would be brutally revealed uh, at the outbreak of the First World War. For years leading up to the war, which everybody could see uh, was coming, was a product of the contradictions of uh, imperialism, crisis of capitalism on a world scale. For years leading up to that war, the position of the Second International had been that they were to oppose the coming war and attempt to prevent it through working class action. This policy was refer affirmed time and time again in the resolutions uh, of the International. Yet when Germany was to declare war on Russia on the 1st of August in 1914, the SPD lined up behind the German bourgeoisie in total support for the war. The leaders maintained that the war was purely defensive and that German workers had a duty to support it in order to defend their gains against the threat of Tsarist despotism. In France, the French socialists told the French workers that they must fight to defend itself against German militarism, and so on. Whatever lies they might have told themselves to justify this betrayal, the reality was that these so-called socialists offered their total support for the slaughter of millions of workers internationally and worked hand in hand with their own bourgeoisie to enable it. This is without doubt the greatest betrayal in the whole history of the workers' movement. And as Lenin said, it marked the death of the international as a force for socialism. On the 4th of August, the SPD deputies in the Reichstag voted unanimously in favor of war credits. Although there were some deputies in, in the party, uh, most famous, famously Karl Liebknecht, had opposed this, in private they were in a small minority, and they decided to publicly respect party discipline and vote in favour. It was only later in December that Liebknecht realised his mistake and decided to vote alone against ascending the war credits, thereby making himself a symbol of opposition uh, to the war and a rallying point for its scattered forces. With this act, he started the split in the German workers' movement between the reformists and the revolutionaries. But it was a split that would take several years to come to fruition, and even then it would be confused and incomplete. Liebknecht was, of course, not alone in his opposition, but the forces of genuine revolutionaries in Germany were small and scattered. At the outbreak of the war, Rosa Luxemburg attempted to start to organise them into an, an initial meeting against the war. She sent out over 300 telegrams to, to well-known radicals and leftists in the SPD, but only Clara Zetkin replied to her without reservation or opposition. But despite this initial setback, Karl and Rosa gathered together whom they could and formed the Internationale group to oppose uh, the war. This nucleus would later go on to become uh, known as the famed Spartacist League. 
Yet despite the prestige of Liebknecht, as the figurehead of the movement, the Spartacists remained numerically weak, even as the opposition to the war began to grow amongst the working class. Rather than a genuine party, the Spartacists were a loose network. They were effectively a group of generals without an army. And in the absence of experienced cadres, arrests or mobilizations, uh, i.e. being sent to the front, could eas easily break up their insecure connections and, and, and bad organization. The reputation of Karl and Rosa as towering figureheads of the German movement alone meant that they could call and lead large demonstrations uh, and strikes. They had the ear of the workers, but in the absence of a centralized, educated, and disciplined party structure, they were unable to recruit these most radical workers and could not build upon their successes. This was their key mistake and a theme that would recur throughout the course of the revolution. Nevertheless, almost alone amongst the international socialist movement, they openly criticized the imperialist character of the war and called for a class struggle to bring it to an end. While Leibniz coined the celebrated phrase that we still use today, the main enemy uh, is at home, of course, referring to our own ruling class. Lenin and the Bolsheviks, of course, had a similar position, but one that was different in several important uh, ways. While they agreed on the clear imperialist nature of the war, Rosa thought that class struggle could end the war and win peace. In contrast, Lenin thought that the imperialist war had to be turned into a civil war against your own ruling class, against the bourgeoisie, to overthrow capitalism. And of course, this was a prognosis that was brilliantly proved correct in the experience of Russia in 1917. So while the SPD leaders gave their fulsome backing to the war, the reality for workers was bloodshed at the front as they were signed up uh, to the military and misery for those back at home in the munitions factory, while everyone everywhere starved. Except, of course, the bosses who continued to make a tidy profit uh, from the slaughter. Even at the start of the war, ration cards for German workers entitled them to only one third of uh, the necessary daily calories. And while the SPD and the trade union leaders worked hand in glove with the general staff of the German army to try and subjugate the workers to the war machine and ensue, ensure civil peace. Despite this, as in Russia, opposition naturally began to grow towards the war. It started in May 1915 with over a thousand women demonstrating for peace, peace in front of the Reichstag. And when the Spartacists called a demonstration against the, year, uh, the war a year later, on May Day in 1960, 1916, uh, they were joined by 10,000 workers. At this time, Liebknecht was arrested for his anti-war propaganda and sentenced to four years imprisonment in a fortress. On the day of his trial, there were several demonstrations and 55,000 munition workers went on strike. Hundreds of Spartacist workers were arrested and in July, Luxembourg was also uh, arrested. This growing opposition, coupled with the German state's increasingly brutal crackdown on the organization of the German workers, led to a mounting pressure from the working class, which began to reflect itself inside the SDP. A layer of the party leadership had organized themselves as something of a loyal opposition, um, which in fact played a useful role for the SPD leaders because they could pretend that the party was in fact still genuinely democratic and then some level of opposition uh, was allowed. And these loyal opposition leaders, uh, instead of voting against the war measures in, in the Reichstag, they simply they abstained. They, voted out, they walked out when the votes were taken. But the level of the repression that was happening against the workers pushed them to breaking point. And in May 1916, Haas gave a speech, one of the leaders uh, of, of this loyal opposition, violently attacking the government and its state of siege against the working class. And along with 33 other oppositionist deputies, they voted against the renewal of the state's special repressive powers. The response to the SPD leadership was immediate. All 33 deputies were expelled from the parliamentary group. You could see here inside the SPD that the party was tearing itself apart under the pressures of the class struggle, under the pressures of conflicting class forces. On the one hand, you had the ruling class acting through the leadership to maintain the full support for the war, but the working class were compelling the opposition to express their will to resist. And while the opposition leaders were responsive to this pressure from the working class, to the mood of the class, they weren't revolutionaries. They had begun to oppose the war, yes, but only on pacifist uh, terms. In Marxist terms, we refer to this as a centrist current. Centrist, in, in, in this context, means uh, people who waver between reform uh, and revolution. And such was their weakness that they weren't willing or prepared uh, to split from the party. Instead, that split was forced upon them 
by the SPD leaders who had set out ruthlessly to crush all opposition, acting as the agents of the German ruling class. And so when the opposition organized a conference in January 1917, this was used as an excuse to summarily expel them en masse from the party. As a result, the opposition took almost 120,000 members from the SPD to form the new independent uh, Social Democratic Party of Germany, the USPD. The USPD was a very heterogeneous uh, party. Uh, on the one hand, the Spartacists decided to join it because Luxembourg uh, mistakenly had the fear that if the revolutionaries were to form their own independent party, they would isolate themselves from the masses. But on the other end of the spectrum, you had the infamous reformist leaders such as uh, Kautsky and Bernstein who joined the party, likely actually at the behest of the ruling class to act as a counterweight to the Spartacists. In the middle was a confused mass of centrist workers uh, and leaders. So on the eve of the German Revolution, the working class was presented with a leadership of three main tendencies, organized, confusingly, into two separate parties. This lack of clarity between the reformists and the revolutionaries was to have serious consequences in the events uh, that followed. So we arrive at 1917, which was a major turning point in the First World War. Of course, we had the Russian Revolution, which was the most spectacular manifestation of a crisis, but a crisis that wasn't excluded to Russia alone. It shook all the warring countries. In the harsh conditions of the war, the Russian workers demonstrated to their German brothers and sisters that not only was a victorious revolution possible, but it could lead in an end to the slaughter. The inspiration of Russia, combined with the worsening conditions uh, in Germany for workers and soldiers, laid the basis for the coming revolution. In 1916, almost 240,000 German soldiers died in the Battle of Verdun alone. While the potato harvest that year, anyone who's, apologies to German comrades uh, here, but anyone who's familiar with German cuisine will know that potatoes are incredibly uh, important to it, uh, fell by more than half. In the winter of, German, uh, of, of 1917 to 18, conditions were horrible. Thousands of children died of hypothermia and the German workers lived on starvation rations where the weekly bread ration was cut by half. This acted as the trigger for the largest and most militant strike of the war years when in January 1918, over a million munitions workers went on strike against the war. The strike was largely organized by an independent group called the Revolutionary Stewards, um, who were independent from the official union uh, leadership uh, and played an important role amongst the, the, the metal and munitions workers of, of Berlin. But they also had a strong base throughout the country in, in the Ruhr, in Saxony, uh, Hamburg and Kiel. They would in fact play a leading role in the, in the revolution that was, was to come and would later join the USPD. But due to the weakness of the leadership and manoeuvrings of the SPD who attempted to take leadership over the strike action and then betray it, explicitly with the objective of ending the strike, it was defeated. And more than 100,000 strikers were sent uh, to the front. The German ruling class was terrified of this growing uh, ferment amongst the German working class. So in an attempt to prevent the coming revolution, uh, a more reformist parliamentary government was established with the Kaiser's cousin, uh, Prince Max von Baden, uh, at its head. The new government passed a number of concessions in an attempt to appease the working class. In October, there was an amnesty for political prisoners uh, and Liebknecht was uh, 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 released and he was greeted by 20,000 Berlin workers uh, on his release. However, Luxembourg was still kept uh, in prison. The German ruling class thought that after they'd concluded uh, peace with Russia, that this would enable them uh, to win the war. If they could close down the Eastern Front, they could concentrate all of their forces on uh, the Western Front and, and, and spearhead and advance uh, uh, against the French and British forces. Uh, but this was an absolute uh, uh, disaster. The German army was effectively disintegrating and more than 400,000 soldiers uh, 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 deserted during this uh, um, advance. It was clear that Germany could no longer win the war. Yet on the October the 28th, the German High Command issued an order to launch an offensive in the North Sea, uh, what, in what they saw as an attempt to save uh, Germany's honor as a kind of last ditch uh, suicide mission. And this would have risked the lives of over 80,000 sailors. Um, and as we know, if anyone studied the, the Russian Revolution, sailors are historically, um, some of the most revolutionary section of the armed forces. 
Uh, this is because naval crews are, are, are made up of skilled workers who are often class conscious and had an experience of class struggle. In Germany, there was the added fact that the Navy mostly stayed in the port uh, during the war, which enabled them to main close con maintain close contact with the workers' movement uh, on shore. Already previously in 1917, the sailors had actually built a clandestine, an incredibly powerful revolutionary organization across several uh, ships in the Navy. After organizing hunger strikes and walkouts, this movement was beheaded when their leaders were executed. But this memory was fresh in the mind of the sailors when the order was to go, uh, came to go to sea in November 1918. And spontaneous demonstrations erupted across several ships and about a thousand sailors uh, were arrested. So remembering the executions of the previous year and concern for their comrades' fates, the remaining sailors sought support from the workers on shore. They arranged a public demonstration on the 3rd of November, which came across a, 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 a patrol of military police, which set fire upon the demonstration, killing nine sailors. That night, in response, ships across the Navy held meetings to elect councils and form committees to represent the sailors of the Kiel garrison. They demanded the abolition of saluting, shorter periods of service, more leave, and the arrest of all of those leaders who had been arrested. All of which the Admiral in command of the fleet uh, in Kiel accepted. So terrified was he of the power of this movement. The red flag was hoisted across sh uh, uh, ships, and the workers on shore began to elect their own councils and organize for a general strike. The success of this mutiny set, across, uh, set a revolutionary blaze across Germany as the movement of workers, soldiers, and sailors uh, uh, spread, and they began to uh, implement and set up councils uh, uh, wherever they could. On the 6th of November, councils took power in Hamburg, Bremen, and Liebeck. In the next ten, two days, 10 uh, other cities uh, followed. And these councils, there's, 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 there's been much kind of um, attempt in, in bourgeois history to try and downplay the role of the councils in the German Revolution, to say that they weren't real... Uh, workers' councils. They weren't. They 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 didn't hold uh, uh, power, and they they weren't equivalent uh, to the Soviets. And although the the councils in Germany did have uh, uh, several weaknesses, which I probably don't have time to go into, they were effectively the same as the the, the Russian so Soviets. They were they were organisations of workers' power that advanced the revolution and threatened the power of the bourgeois state. And this movement spread. By the 9th of uh, November, workers and soldiers' councils were established in Berlin. Already in late October, Leibniz had been uh, organizing with the USPD and the revolutionary stewards, uh, pushing the idea of a mass demonstration building to a general strike as a prelude uh, to an insurrection. But the leaders had dithered, uh, and of course this would be a reoccurring theme, and could not agree a plan of action. This confusion on the part of the leadership would be characteristic as the revolution continued to develop and would contribute to its eventual uh, defeat. But the explosion in Kiel swept aside all this dithering uh, and forced them into action. The SPD, who had played no role in this movement, could feel uh, the coming storm and were concerned that their influence over the masses was slipping away. To try and regain ground, their government ministers had started to call for the Kaiser to abdicate from the 23rd of October. But this was a merely an attempt to appease the workers, to try and gain control of the movement and divert it away uh, from the danger of Bolshevism. But of course, these small concessions weren't enough. The SPD leaders heard from their factory representatives that the SPD was no longer, uh, 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 um, that there was no longer any way to hold back the workers uh, from revolution. And that the factory workers were unequivocally following the USPD uh, and the influence of the SPD was waning. Thus, the SPD was forced to back the movement as a means of controlling it. The ruling class was desperate. All across Berlin, the masses were on the streets. From the early morning of the 9th of November, the USPD was handing out leaflets calling for an armed uprising. Armed soldiers, women, children, and the working masses of Berlin gathered in the center of town. Ebert and Scheidemann, the, the leaders of the SPD, met with Max of Baden, who announced the ab uh, abdication of the Kaiser. In fact, he, he, he asked the Kaiser to abdicate. The Kaiser refused and said, you need to send in the army to, to shoot these bastards. He was told that there was no army left <laughs> with which he could uh, shoot the workers. Um, so uh, Max of Barnett announced his abdication uh, without in fact telling him that he was abdicating. Um, and they offered Ebert, the leader of the SPD, to become the chancellor, which he accepted and issued an appeal 
uh, for calm and discipline. In order to hamstring the USPD, who had by this time assumed leadership of the movement and trapped them into parliamentary reformism, uh, they invited them to join a, a coalition government with the SPD and share power. Meanwhile, the revolution was sweeping across Berlin. Workers marched on the prisons and forced the release of over 600 political prisoners. The garrison came over totally to the revolution and the police headquarters surrendered to a detachment of armed workers led by Eichhorn, um, uh, uh, an old radical from the USPD who was to assume the role of Berlin police chief. Such was the intensity of the revolutionary feeling that tens of thousands of workers surrounded the Reichstag and under pressure they, f they forced uh, Scheidemann to come out and speak from the balcony. He attempted to preach calm, uh, but when uh, the workers clearly demonstrated that they weren't satisfied uh, with this, um, and in order to try and prevent further revolutionary action for them, he was forced into proclaiming uh, a republic, which greatly annoyed uh, uh, Ebert, who, you know, that wasn't in the plan of the SPD. And just a few miles away, a separate demonstration at the Imperial Palace, Liebknecht declared the birth of the German Socialist Republic. Of course, this was somewhat uh, premature, as what existed in Germany wasn't yet a socialist republic. But nevertheless, he was cheered on by tens of thousands of workers. They agreed that on the next day, the 10th of November, uh, in every factory, in every barracks, uh, in every workplace across Berlin, at 10 a.m., meetings would be held to ele uh, elect delegates to a general assembly later that day in Bush Circus, which would take place at 5 p.m. to appoint the new revolutionary government. So even though the SPD was clearly opposed uh, to this, they couldn't prevent it. So instead, again, they attempted to take control uh, of the movement. And they spent the whole night mobilizing uh, their supporters in the factories and barracks. The SPD wanted this meeting to endorse the new essentially bourgeois uh, government that had been established after Ebert had been invited to become chancellor and call for the establishment of a constituent assembly, meaning they wanted to halt the revolution and divert it back into safe reformist channels of bourgeois government. They extensively drilled their delegates um, uh, that the line that they would put forward was that they had to defend the interests of the entire people against the rule of one class, meaning defending the rule of the bourgeoisie over the dictatorship of the proletariat. Forcing the, the, the um, assembly to accept the coalition government against the power of the councils that had been uh, established across Germany. And in this way, they orchestrated the outcome of the meeting. So when the meeting came, there was in fact a clear majority uh, for the USPD amongst the workers' uh, representatives. But with arms in hand, the soldiers who'd been organized by the SPD pushed through the election of a Council of People's Commissars with the same uh, uh, division, an equal division between the SPD and the USPD, forcing parity uh, between the workers' parties. And every time um, a representative of the revolutionary wing tried to speak from the podium, they were drowned out by soldiers who just screamed unity and, and, and brandished their rifles. In this way, the most elementary principles of workers' democracy were violated by a rowdy minority uh, who forced and prevented the majority from declaring their position through a, vault, a vote. The end result that Ebert found himself in a very strange position. He was the head of both a bourgeois parliamentary government as chancellor and also the revolutionary government of people's commissars that was elected by the councils. The SPD had won an enormous victory and seized total control of the revolution even though they had done absolutely everything to prevent it. They had a clear program. They wanted to dissolve the workers and soldiers councils and instead convene a constituent assembly to establish order, to hand back the power to the ruling class and to overturn the revolution. In this way, although they were forced to cloak their actions in the language of the revolution and democracy, they were clearly counter-revolutionary. But even though they'd won the first battle, they hadn't yet won the war. The workers of Germany didn't want to give up everything they'd achieved and this opened up a period of struggle in the coming months. And what existed in Germany uh, in this time is, is precisely the same situation that existed in Russia between February and October 1917. It was a position of dual power. Uh, on the one hand, you had the proletarian workers' democracy represented by the workers' and soldiers' councils. On the other hand, you had the bourgeois state with the SPD at its head. And as we know, these two forms of power cannot coexist indefinitely. Must, one must win out uh, uh, over the other. In some ways, the prospect for a, a, a victorious workers' revolution seemed more serious in Germany in November uh, in 1918 than in Russia 
and in February 1917, the German revolutionaries had played a much larger role in the establishment of the workers' councils than the Bolsheviks had uh, in February. And while in Russia, the Mensheviks and the SRs had almost complete domination over the Soviets. In Germany, there was a divide between the SPD and the USPD. And even several of the most important councils were led by Spartacists or revolutionary stewards. But the process by which the masses develop consciousness in a revolutionary situation is a complex one and it isn't one that proceeds uh, in a straight line. The masses are constantly being increased by uh, new and fresh layers drawn into political activity who've never cared about politics before in the process of a revolution, awakened to political consciousness uh, for the first time. These were previously unorganized workers and uh, demobilized soldiers upon whom the war had inflicted Im immense suffering and they hoped for a rapid improvement in their living conditions. These masses knew little of the past betrayals of the SPD and they saw the SPD as the incarnation of the revolution because they were the party that had been brought to power by it and they were seen to lead it. These layers could only be won to a revolutionary position through a clear analysis and through patient explanation with demands that connected uh, to their experience, combined with the flexible tactics to meet them where they are. They could only be broken from the reformist leaders uh, through this method. And this is exactly what the Bolsheviks, of course, did in 1917, in winning the workers away from the Mensheviks and the SRs. Instead, the Spartacists, as, as, as the revolutionary wing of the workers' movement, in, adopted a, a tone of shrill cries of, cries of betrayal uh, towards the SPD. Uh, and the revolutionaries were in fact seen as troublemakers by the wider layer of the working class who desired unity. Moreover, they weren't a revolutionary leadership that was capable of waging a patient power for struggle in the councils to win the majority so that the councils could be transformed into a weapon in the struggle for power and the basis for a new workers' state. In the absence of such a leadership, the SPD would not only be able to maintain their control, but in fact over the coming months were to strengthen it. While the fresh layers of the revolution looked to the SPD, the most advanced and uh, uh, developed workers formed the basis of the USPD's support. But while they were formerly members of the party, and, and, and Luxembourg had the perspective of, of winning the membership to a revolutionary stance, nowhere did the Spartacists in fact try to put this perspective into, in, in, into practice. Uh, they didn't exist as an organized uh, faction. They didn't undertake any systemic work to build their organization and operate as an organized tendency within inside the USPD or even the councils themselves. Instead, their work rested entirely on propaganda and the organization uh, of, of strikes and demonstrations. The SPD thought that the councils should exist only uh, to help establish a new democratic regime based on universal suffrage of a constituent assembly. On this basis, they struggled for the convocation of this assembly to draw a line under the revolution uh, as quickly as possible, to strip the councils of their power. In this, they were aided by the entire array of, of bourgeois forces uh, and media who, who overnight had proclaimed themselves Republicans and supporters of democracy and demanded the convocation of the, the Constituent Assembly uh, as soon as possible. The USPD leaders, on the other hand, had a very confused position. Uh, th th their members in government kind of tried to kind of like delay the election of the Constituent Assembly, like, you know, raise some technicalities, but fundamentally they didn't oppose it. Only the Spartacists, in fact, offered a coherent opposition uh, to it. And as Luxembourg wrote, the choice today is not between democracy and dictatorship. The question history has placed on the agenda is bourgeois democracy or socialist democracy. For the dictatorship of the proletariat is democracy in the socialist sense of the term. What she means here is that the Constituent Assembly uh, was the embodiment of uh, ensuring the continued rule of bourgeois uh, democracy only by handing power or the workers and soldiers councils assuming power uh, uh, themselves could bourgeois democracy be replaced with, uh, with workers' democracy, which of course is the fundamental uh, um, uh, starting point for the overthrow of capitalism and the construction of a communist uh, society. So by the time of the Congress of the Councils in December, it revealed the massive extent of the SPD's victory. Out of 489 delegates, uh, there was a clear majority for the SPD with 288 against 90 independents, only 10 of whom were Spartacists. And through manoeuvrings, both Luxembourg and Liebnik were denied uh, to become delegates in, in the Congress. So the Spartacists tried to influence it from the outside. And they organized a massive protest of 250,000 uh, workers that demanded a united socialist republic uh, 
of Workers' and social count Soldiers' Councils. But the Congress was unmoved and voted uh, to set the date for elections uh, for the 19th of January. Throughout December, the counter-revolution had started to flex its muscles. The army chiefs were losing patience and putting pressure on the SDP to put a stop to the revolutionary madness. Ebert had agreed with the army generals that they would form uh, 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 10 new divisions of soldiers and send them into Berlin to disarm the workers. But this plan to, uh, to purge Berlin of Bolshevism fell apart almost immediately. As soon as the division arrived in Berlin, they collapsed and went over to the revolution. It was clear that the regular army could not be used uh, against the workers and another instrument had to be found. That instrument was the, the formation of the, the Free Corps through demobilized soldiers, which would later go on to play an important role in the development, of course, of the Nazi party, uh, which was formed by uh, uh, Gustav Nosk, who became the kind of embodiment of the counter-revolution and was a leader of the SPD. So the government tried to move uh, uh, forces uh, against the revolution uh, time and time again. Uh, a division of sailors who had been posted in Berlin um, since the days of the revolution uh, had, had, had been won over uh, to the revolution. They'd become fully <coughs> radicalized and they'd started to join the, the Spartacist demonstrations. Uh, the government ordered them uh, to be disbanded and refused to pay them until they, uh, the, they left Berlin. But the sailors refused and they marched on the Berlin headquarters to demand their money, where they were met with an armored car that opened fire uh, and killing six. In response, the sailors uh, uh, stormed the building and arrested the commanders. The government sent in troops with orders to shell the building and unless the sailors uh, surrendered. But the sound of gunfire alerted the workers of Berlin who came to their aid and completely overwhelmed uh, the soldiers and, and, and demobilized, disarmed them uh, and saved uh, the sailors. These workers were driven by a vague awareness that the immediate revolutionary violence was the only effective weapon against the counter-revolution. But without a leadership capable of organizing them, they couldn't move beyond such limited action towards the seizure of power, which was the only necessary means of defeating uh, the counter-revolution. It was around this time that we had the development and foundation of, of, of the Communist Party of, uh, of, of, of Germany. The, the, the continued insistence on, of the USPD leaders on, main, uh, on staying in the government, of, uh, which of course was, uh, as I have explained, carrying out an active counter-revolution uh, against the workers of, uh, of, of, of Germany and their support for the convocation of the Constituent Assembly uh, finally pushed uh, the Spartacists in, into splitting uh, uh, from the USPD and they founded uh, the German Communist Party um, in uh, December of uh, 1918. Uh, the party that was to be founded was a very confused uh, party uh, and it was a party that had uh, uh, very strong ultra-left um, uh, elements. Basically, the, 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 kind of the, the, the main basis of the membership of, of the Spartacist uh, League and the other organizations that would go on to form the KPD uh, were young uh, 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 workers who, who didn't really understand the experience uh, of, of Bolshevism. They saw Bolshevism as personified in the insurrection alone. They didn't have an understanding of, of the long period of patient explanation that the Bolsheviks uh, uh, had, had undertook to win the leadership of the working class. And they thought that through sheer militancy alone uh, that they could win a revolution. Uh, and this, of course, was to have tragic consequences in a number of um, the policies that the, 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 the Communist Party adopted. For example, uh, uh, um, boycotting elections to the Constituent Assembly and in fact, um, some resolutions um, uh, uh, calling on, on their members to, to leave the trade unions uh, were put forward, although that they weren't um, voted on. So it's in this context that we arrive uh, at, at the final showdown in January um, 1919. Uh, There'd been a slow build uh, of the counter-revolution uh, in December, uh, as I've described, but this came to a violent and bloody conclusion in January closing this chapter of the revolution. The SPD, together with the general staff and the German bourgeoisie, wanted to cross the revolutionary movement once and for all. They opened up a vicious campaign of slander against the Spartacists, uh, with the bourgeois press working hand in glove with the SDP paper. The stage was being set uh, for a showdown, and the government prepared a trap for the workers and the revolutionaries. They pit their target in the form of the Berlin uh, police chief, who, as I've described before, was an old radical and a member of the USPD. 
He'd been brought into that role uh, by the revolution and was immensely popular amongst the Berlin workers. But the ruling class in this, in this position of dual power was attempting to regain control of all the arms of the state. And they could not tolerate the head of the Berlin police uh, being a revolutionary. And that evening, representatives from the USPD, the Communist Party, and the revolutionary stewards met to discuss the way forward. For the first time, they were all in agreement. They thought that the retreat had gone on for far too long and it was necessary to fight back uh, with the general strike. However, the position wasn't as clear as this. The German, in Germany, the Berlin workers were far ahead of the rest of the, the country. They were far more developed and militant. And if they had attempted uh, to take power in this situation, they would have left themselves uh, exposed and isolated and open to the forces of the counter-revolution to crush them. It was exactly the same situation that existed in the July days uh, in Russia in 1917. And of course, in Russia, the, the Bolsheviks, understanding the, the balance of forces, had advised the workers of Petrograd not to attempt to seek power through an armed demonstration. They had attempted to hold them back, putting forward the, 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 the perspective that the rest of the country had to be uh, uh, won over. And although this was uh, the position that Luxembourg herself uh, uh, understood, such was the, 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 the explosion of anger amongst the Berlin workers and, 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 and the massive demonstration that the other leaders of, of, of the movement let this go to their head. And they thought that on the basis of, of, of this powerful strike movement that they could in fact overthrow uh, uh, the government. Um, so to build momentum towards this insurrection, a revolutionary committed, uh, uh, committee was established. Um, and the next day, 500,000 workers were spontaneously on strike and began to occupy uh, key uh, buildings across Berlin. But the Revolutionary Committee was in permanent session during this time, but it had no clear plan and could not give any direction to the workers. It was completely uh, impotent. They had vacillation and endless discussion uh, without a plan to actually uh, 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 take power. And although this is a long quote, and I'm almost out of time, uh, I'm going to read it because uh, I think it is the most clear demonstration. When, when we talk about the role of leadership, it can often seem uh, abstract. And here is, is kind of, in this incident, in this revolution, is the most kind of uh, clear crystallization of how important uh, leadership is, or how workers look uh, uh, to leaders as a way forward. The masses were there very early, from nine o'clock, in the cold and the fog. The Revolutionary Committee was in session somewhere deliberating. The fog grew heavier and the masses were still waiting, but the leaders still deliberated. Midday came, bringing hunger as well as cold, and still the leaders deliberated. The masses were delirious with excitement. They wanted action, something to relieve their delirium, but no one knew what. The leaders deliberated. The fog grew thicker and with it came twilight. The masses returned, sadly homeward, they had wanted some great event, but they had done nothing. And still the leaders deliberated. They deliberated all day. They continued to deliberate all night. The workers stood outside on the empty Alexanderplatz with their rifles in their hands and with their light and heavy machine guns. Inside, the leaders still deliberated. At the police headquarters, the guns were aimed. There were soldiers at every corner, and in all rooms overlooking the street, there was a seething mass of soldiers, sailors, and workers. Inside, the leaders were sitting, deliberating. They sat all evening, they sat all night, and still they deliberated. And they were sitting there at dawn the next morning, still deliberating. The groups came back again, and the leaders were still sitting and deliberating. They deliberated and deliberated and deliberated. And I think this shows you, um, the clear role of leadership, the, the, the absolute importance of a perspective, of a strategy, of a plan of action to lead uh, the workers to the conquest of power. Uh, and it, it was this that was completely uh, uh, absent in, in Berlin in this time. The counter-revolution had set a trap and the, revolutionary walked, the revolutionaries walked straight into it. And without any leadership, without a means to take the movement forward, the counter-revolution was able uh, to regain control. In this moment, what would have been correct was actually to, 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 to advise the workers uh, uh, to go back to work, to retreat from the strike, and to maintain their forces uh, for another day. Uh, but the Spartacists refused uh, to do this, and the counter-revolution moved in with bloody consequences. The Freikorps that had been formed slaughtered 
uh, workers. They shelled the buildings that had been occupied uh, 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 by workers and one by one won back the districts of Berlin uh, to bourgeois order. By the 15th of January, they found both Liebnik and, and Luxembourg, who'd been in hiding, uh, but criminally, out of their own uh, um, arrogance, they'd refused to flee uh, Berlin, as, as, as Lenin had done in Petrograd in, in, in July. And so they were arrested. And that night, Liebknecht was escorted out of the building uh, where they were held, and he was shot officially for trying to escape. Luxembourg had her skull smashed in by the rifle, uh, a butt of a rifle, and her unconscious body was thrown into a canal where she was not discovered until the 31st of May. The people who carried out these uh, atrocities got away, but we know that the real responsibility resided with the heads of the SDP. And this is a bloody crime that separates uh, the revolutionaries from the reformists uh, to this day. After the crushing of this uprising, the counter-revolutionary forces took the initiative in several provinces to, to, to restore law and order. They broke up the workers' and soldiers' councils uh, by force, and thousands were killed trying to defend their councils. By the end of February, um, uh, no, I have to skip this bit because I'm being told uh, uh, to sum up. Um, the workers, uh, you know, continued to try uh, and battle uh, the, the counter-revolution, but the, in the absence of uh, a leadership, they were they were outmaneuvered and outgunned. While the revolutionaries had no leadership, the counter-revolution had a clear leadership in the form of the SPD, who sent out to set out to liquidate uh, the workers' councils. Uh, and restore order. And in this means, uh, uh, with the movement beheaded, the, leaders, the, the revolution uh, was defeated. It wasn't defeated permanently. There would be many other times uh, uh, in, the, in the coming months and years where the German revolutionaries could have taken uh, power. And the German Communist Party, in fact, grew to become a powerful mass uh, 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 communist party that had the ears of millions of workers, a party that could have stopped uh, the rise of Hitler. In 1923, the details of which I don't have time to go into, perhaps I can come to that uh, in, 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 in the reply, could have overthrown capitalism, uh, 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 but, but shamefully cancelled the insurrection uh, at the last minute, leading uh, to defeat. So this is a period of, 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 of revolution, of counter-revolution, but it most clearly uh, and explicitly demonstrates uh, uh, the importance of revolutionary leadership that in the course of the revolution, it doesn't matter how much the workers want to struggle. It doesn't matter how militant uh, the workers are. It doesn't matter how prepared for self-sacrifice they are. If there isn't an organization that has the correct program, that can show them the way forward, that can lead them to the abolition and the overthrow of capitalism, to institute themselves as the new power in society, that revolution will be defeated. And that's why here today and throughout this weekend, we are discussing how to build such a revolutionary leadership because still today that leadership is lacking. And it is the most urgent task of all communists that if we are to struggle, if we are to fight for communism, we need to learn from the mistakes of past revolutions. We need to prevent future counter-revolutionary victories. We need to build a, re a revolutionary leadership that is capable of putting forward that program of leading our class, the working class, to the final overthrow and defeat of capitalism and the construction of a communist society across the world. That's all for this episode of Marxist Voice, so thanks for listening. But before you go, a few announcements. First, we're not just here to talk about the need for revolutionary leadership, we're here to build it. On Monday, the World School of Communism and the founding conference of the Revolutionary Communist International will begin. And revolutionaries from all over the world will gather to discuss things like bureaucracy, Lenin and Trotsky's real legacy, the Bolsheviks in power, and the building of the Revolutionary International. This will be a school of the revolutionary leadership of the future, so sign up today. And if you're not lucky enough to go in person, you can stream the sessions live on YouTube or watch them on the website schoolofcommunism.com. Secondly, if you want to learn more about the German Revolution, then get a copy of Rob Sewell's book, Socialism or Barbarism, The German Revolution from 1918 to 1933, which details the whole history of the revolutionary process, all the way from the overthrow of the Kaiser to the rise of Hitler. It's full of lessons for revolutionaries and you can get a copy today from Well Read Books. Link in the description for all of these down below. That's all for this week, but we'll be back next time with another episode of Marxist Voice, podcast of the Revolutionary Communist Party.